the uh, like we are back in session. Parks and Council are present on members of the Jury and Alternates are present. And you uh, may continue your examination. Okay, so when we left off, uh, Agent Bowles, we were talking about uh, just the formatting of a CDR uh, called called data record, is that right? Called detail, detail record. Detail record, sorry. Um, so I zoomed in on 439C to the top right corner. Can you at least describe for us, just kind of run us through what we're seeing. Yes, um, so the, the information on the top where it says run date, that just tells you the date that the, um, the records were pulled by at and in this case. Um, the voice usage um, indicator tells you the, the phone number that was these records pertain to, and, and then it also tells you that this is for voice information only, uh, so it's not a text message or data connection. Um, the account number is just their internal account number for <coughs> purposes. Um, and then from then on down are the individual columns. So each horizontal row indicates a network interaction. Um, so the first, um, starting with the left column, which is labeled as item, that's simply just a number one through 10,000 or however many calls there are in this record. Uh, and they go in numeric order. The connection date uh, is the date that the, the call took place. Connection time is the time the call took place. Um, at the time these records were pulled, the seizure time is, is the time that exists prior to the, uh, the actual connection of the voices. So that's when you press send and there's that, uh, sometimes it's 3 seconds, sometimes 20 seconds, depending on how many rings there are. All that time, that's the seizure time. Um, and then the next column over is the originating number, and that's the phone number that initiated the phone call. Okay, you have the, the next column over is the terminating number that tells you where that call ended um, or who, who received that phone call. The elapsed time is what uh, is we often refer to as talk time. That's the amount of time that they, people actually spoke, um, or at least I should say that the, the line was open between the two phones. Um, the next, uh, next category there is number dialed. Um, and that, that actually tells you what was punched into the phone. Um, so example, on international calls, you may see additional digits there. Um, in some cases, you'll see it where the, the individual did not dial the, um, the area code. Um, so you can see that here in the number dialed. Okay. Next column is uh, what's labeled IMEI. And that stands for the, it's basically an equipment identifier. Um, I believe it's International Mobile Equipment Identifier. You can think of that as like a serial number that identifies the physical handset, the actual phone. Um, most individuals and phone users don't even know what their IMEI is, but the cell phone company likes to know what, what phone you have with you. The MZ, which is the subscriber identity, that is tied to the SIM card inside the phone. That actually has the subscriber information, um, which is sort of a separate uh, entity than the actual phone. Uh, but when you marry those two together, you have a working phone. Um, the next column is a description. It gives you an idea of uh, what went on. You have a mobile to mobile call, uh, an outside to mobile call, which would be like a landline calling a mobile. Um, if you see, as you can see, about the fourth item down, it says VMC, and that's a voicemail check, indicating the person checked their voicemail. So there's a series of codes there um, that will indicate kind of what, what occurred with that particular phone call. And last but not least, the last column on the right is? The cell location. Can you decipher that series of numbers for us? Yes. <clears throat> so I'll use the pointer here to help you. So we'll look at the first row. If it's easier for you to stand up instead of wrenching your back and neck, feel free. All right, I'll speak loud if that's okay. Is that okay with you, sir? Absolutely. So if you look here at the, we'll just use the first row for, for ease. You'll start with uh, two numbers separated by a dash. In this case, 05267 and then 29437. The first number here 
the 5267 is known as a, a LAC or a location area code. Um, you can think of it as um, a code that identifies a, a group of cell towers in a geographic area, very similar to an area code for your phone number. Um, if you have a 909 number, you pretty much know you live somewhere in the San Bernardino County area typically. Um, so they, that's, it's just the AT&T's way of sort of managing their assets out in the, out in the world. The next number, 29437, indicates uh, <coughs> the actual cell tower within that LAC. And so that's going to be not only, it's not only going to indicate um, sort of the pole sticking out of the ground, so to speak, but it's also going to indicate the specific antenna on that pole that carried that uh, call. The next, after the colon, you see this negative 117 number. That's um, the longitude. Um, which, and then the next number after the next colon, which is a 34 point number, um, that indicates the latitude. Um, so that gives you the geographic spot on the map. Um, and after the last colon, you see a 340. The 340 indicates what's, what's known as the azimuth, um, which is a fancy word for direction. Um, and for those who have uh, either been in the Navy or Boy Scouts or whatever, uh, the geographic um, sort of compass, so to speak, is zero degree is due north. And then as you move to the west, 90 degrees. As you go south, 180 degrees. As you go east, I'm sorry, west, 270 degrees. And then back up to 360 degrees. So the, the map goes like in a circle. So in this case, 340 degrees would be 20 degrees off from due north. Um, and that will tell you the direction that that cell tower is pointing. Now most cell towers have three sides to them. Not all, but most of them do. Um, and so you can, essentially if you took a piece of pizza and cut it into three slices of pie, you'd get 120 degree sectors that that antenna would, would have coverage of. I guess to give a, a visual representation of what you just talked about, ignore the quality of my artwork. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pretend that this is north up here. You can zoom out here a bit. Yeah, I went a little far. Okay, we're going to do it right here. This is north, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so teach me the Boy Scout compass and azimuth. Uh, so right there at north would be zero degrees. So if I drew a line right up there, that would be zero degrees, right? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. What else are you going to teach me? <laughs> so if you turned around and walked in the exact opposite direction going south, or you know have an antenna pointing south, to use cell phone terms, that would be 180 degrees. Right? Yes. Okay. And then to the east, which would be to the right. My right? Well, to the right on the screen I'm looking at. I'm guessing <laughs> that would be your right. Would be what? 90 degrees. Okay. And then to the west would be 270 degrees. So it gives you an indicator. So, for example, if you had an azimuth of 45 degrees. Well, we had... Just to go back to the example, we had an example of that first line was 340. Correct. So where in a circle would that 340 land? Slightly left of the N, which would be, because if the N is at zero degrees, which is also known as 360 degrees, because so that's the complete circle. So 340 degrees would be 20 degrees to the left of the N. Okay. So somewhere up in that area. Correct, that would be the direction the antenna is pointing. And the antenna, is that the device that a cell phone would connect to signal-wise? Yes, that's, that's, what the, that's what's communicating with the phone. And the amount of that 360 degrees that a particular antenna covers, is that set always at 120 degrees, or can there be multiple antenna uh, and antennas that break that 360 up even further. Yeah. 
There, in some rare cases, they do have six-sided towers and two-sided towers, in, in which case you could get slightly wider, uh, what, what they call beam width, but in general, uh, approximately 120 degrees is, is the, the width of the, what the antenna covers. Now, back to the call detail record that is developed. And I don't know if it shows on here, and you can tell me if it does or not. Would a handoff or a redirect show in, this in the cell location column for that call? For, for any column in particular? Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, so AT&T's records back in when these were generated, they provided the initiating tower and the terminating tower. If uh, a handoff occurred, or if 20 handoffs occurred, you would only get the first and the last on there. And in some cases, it's the same one. I wanted to go back to something you mentioned right before the break um, that you clarified for me on the break. You mentioned that the cell phone prioritized towers or uh, antennas by signal strength and then deciding which to choose when it seeks or requests resources, right? Yes. And you mentioned that it internally would rank at one, two, three, four, five in priority, right? Yes. And you mentioned that it always would take the, the strongest one? That's the, it's, it's always going to, the phone is always going to choose the most attractive one, which would be the strongest okay. for, for this type of technology. That's what I wanted to, because you gave that disclaimer, this type of technology. Can you please explain it? Yes, yeah, so these records here pertain to 2G technology. Um, officially, it's 2.5G, but essentially it's that second generation sort of um, what we all remember as flip phones. Um, and the 2G technology was purely based on signal strength um, to connect, uh, to decide, you know, what the most attractive tower was. Our current phones, um, you know, the 3G, 4G, as, as we move up now into 5G, um, they still use signal strength as, a, as an indicator, um, but there's uh, signal quality and there's some other issues that are involved with the cell phone selection, or the cell tower selection. But in these particular records that we're looking at, um, that would not be a factor. Is it important when you're doing a historical <laughs> analysis of cell phone activity to understand the technology that was in play at the time you're looking at? Yeah, it's, it's a, a, has a small um, influence on the analysis, but not a very large influence. Okay. What would that small influence be? Um, I just, with the old 2G technology, the um, the networks were a little more robust, they weren't as fine-tuned as they are now, so um, that just, you take that into account when you're looking at it, but it doesn't change what the records show, which is what cell tower the phone shows to connect to. And just to clarify, so in 2010 we were talking 2G technology, right? Yeah, for this particular device, I, I don't recall exactly when networks started rolling out 3G. And today we're talking what kind of technology? Well, they're currently deploying 5G in certain cities at this point. So we're at 4G moving to 5G? Yes, sir. So the technology, would it be fair to say, has um, advanced by leaps and bounds since 2010? Yes. You mentioned uh, when talking about the cell location information, the longitude and latitude, and that represents what? That represents the location of where the cell phone tower is, or where the cell tower is located, not the cell phone. Now, back in 2014, were you asked to assist? the San Diego County Sheriff's Department with an investigation into the disappearance and um, deaths of the McStay family. I was. Okay. And what were you asked to do? I was asked to assist by preparing maps for the cell towers um, 
I believe uh, initially it was it was Detective Hankey, and it was I believe it was August of 2014, asked me to map a few days for him. Um, the, the team working the case appeared very busy, and and Detective Hankey asked me, and I agreed to map a few days for him, and then ultimately it was expanded to I believe 15 days. So you were lending a hand. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Uh, is it common for the Federal Bureau of Investigation to assist local law enforcement in their investigations? It is. And do you have to have some type of authority to do so? Yes, I mean, there's there's ways that we are authorized to help out. In this particular case, there was already an opened FBI investigation out of our San Diego office, uh, which was a, a essentially a missing persons type case. And so you were operating under the guise of that open investigation? Yes, sir. And in lending a helping hand, were you provided uh, cellular phone records for uh, Charles Merritt with a number of 909-374-0102? Yes, sir. Were you also provided um, phone records for uh, Joseph McStay Sr.? Yes, that was a 949 number, but I don't recall the rest of the digits. Uh, does 949-295-7451 sound familiar? Yes, sir. When you were asked to expand your mapping process, were you given any specific reason or were you just asked? I was just asked. I mean, I, at the, the point when I was asked, um, I was provided the phone records and I was provided the latitude and longitude of the crime scene up in the high desert. That's it? That's it to my recollection, yes. How did you go about your task? Tell us what you did. Um, went through the records and essentially started one by one locating, uh, well, let me start back up. I first looked at how the cell phone towers were oriented back in 2010. Um, inside some of our um, FBI computers, we keep uh, records of uh, how phones were oriented back in 2000, or historically. And so I went back to February 2010 to look, and then I went and looked at the actual records and identified the various towers where those phones, or where the, uh, the phone connected on the dates and times in question. And then what did you do with that information? I created a map. Um, I used a software program called Microsoft Streets and Trips. Um, and that allows you to use the latitude and longitudes to uh, put those on a map. And um, because of the vast number of days and just trying to move, uh, map the gross movements of where uh, the cell phone had traveled, um, I decided to just use the physical location of the cell towers and not the full sector information for every single call, um, just because that would provide a, a very rough estimate as to where uh, the cell phone had moved uh, during the periods of time we were looking at. Showing you what's collectively been marked as exhibits 521 through 528. Can you please review those for me? And what are those? Those are maps I generated for um, Joseph McStay's cell phone, which was 949-295-7451. And what information from his cell phone records were important for you to input as data in these maps that you generated? So in, in this particular case, um, I, was, I mapped the, the date of February 4th, 2010, and these phone records were from T-Mobile, um, and they provided um, some information about each uh, cell tower, as far as the cell tower identifier. And so I was able to locate where those cell phone towers are uh, 
uh, exists on the map and uh, mapped out where the cell phone, where his cell phone connected throughout the day on February 4th. Uh, so I'm showing you what I believe is 521. You can always correct me if I'm wrong looking at the map. Can you please describe what we're looking at here with this? Yes, yeah, so this is, again, February 4th, um, and this is uh, Mr. McStay's T-Mobile phone, and it shows that um, between 8.56 and 11.41 a.m., uh, the phone shows a cell tower and connected with a cell tower uh, located near the intersection of Highway 76 and Interstate 15. Okay. And I'm going to ask you on that exhibit, if I can pull it out of the sleeve, are you familiar with where the victim's residence was at the time? Yeah, I knew that it was on, um, I, I thought it was Avocado Lane, but your sheet here says Avocado Vista. So. Avocado Vista Lane, Avocado Lane, that roughly yes. same, do you know where it's located on the map? Uh, I don't know precisely which where the house is, but I believe it's one of these streets here, just to the right of Interstate 15 and south of uh, Highway 76. Okay. Can I have you put a red circle on 521 where that rough location is? Okay. Maybe mark it with uh, letter R for reference. Court's desire, sure. Sorry, I'm going to switch to overhead real quick and then back. I'm not displaying 521. Is that your red circle with the R there? Yes, sir. It's the general location of what you understood to be the mixed day residence? Yes, sir. I see on 521 other red dots. What are those? Those are other T-Mobile cell towers in the, uh, in the area. And then I see a notation for 1143 to 1146. What is that? Yes, those, uh, that's the cell tower that was uh, connected, or that the phone chose to connect to during that period of time for those three minutes. Uh, 522, do you have that in front of you? Numbers are on the back. Yes. Okay, and what is that? Uh, it's continuation, it's a, the next slide, which would be the next uh, series of cell tower connections. Uh, beginning at 11.51, followed by 11.53 a.m., and with the next call at 11.57 a.m., uh, where the cell phone shows those towers um, consistent with the northbound Interstate 15. Okay. You say consistent with. Can you please explain why you say consistent with? Well, these cell tower connections don't tell you precisely where a cell phone is at. It gives you a general area. So I can't testify that he wasn't driving on a side road or that he didn't stop to get a hamburger at a, at a restaurant, um, the, based on the times and the position of where those cell towers are, I can just say it's consistent with travel in that, in that uh, corridor. Well, are you drawing basically a conclusion from the previous cell tower hits from 521 that went from the last 1141 <coughs> near his residence 1143, 1146, north of his residence, <coughs> and then 1151, 53, 57, continuing towers north and further north and further north from the residence? Yes, sir. Is that just common sense? Yes, sir, but I have to be 
careful with my words. Well, because you're not rendering any type of scientific opinion that you could actually say he was traveling north, right? Can you say scientifically that you know on that day at that time he was moving north? I can just tell you the cell phone connected to cell towers moving in a northern direction. And 523, I believe, is the next one in line. Do you have that in front of you? Yes, sir. And that shows us what? Again, it's the uh, additional calls in uh, chronological order, starting at 11.58, 12 p.m., 12.02 p.m., 12.04 p.m., and 12.11 p.m., uh, again, with uh, a general movement in the, at this point, it's traveling, and the cell phone's traveling in a uh, northwest direction consistent with Interstate 15. And the next, I believe, is around 524? Yes. Okay. Again, this is the next uh, next series of calls now at 1215 and 1222 p.m. as the cell phone connects with towers in the Temescal Canyon area and then further north into the city of Corona. And 525, is that the next one? Yes, uh, a single call uh, at 12.28 p.m. Uh, near the intersection of Limonite Avenue and Interstate 15, which is also known as the Mariloma or Eastdale area. And that would be between, almost halfway in between the 60 and 91 freeways? Yes, that'd be a good assessment. Not an exact measurement, right? That's correct. And uh, 526? Exhibit 526. Um, these are uh, a series of calls um, at 12.52 p.m. as the uh, cell phone connects there in Rancho Cucamonga, just north of Foothill Boulevard and south of Church Street. And, uh, and then there's two calls at 1.01 p.m. and 3.03 p.m. Uh, connecting to a cell tower uh, just slightly to the north east of the first cell tower. Uh, looking at the scale of this exhibit, is approximately 2,000 meters? That black line at the top, is that right? Yes, sir. How close, I mean, based on that scale, do you think those two towers really are to each other? Being that 1,600 meters is approximately a mile, I would say it's probably pretty close to one mile apart from each other. Is that, let's say hypothetically, if a, a person using a cell phone was sitting right at the M on Massey Drive on um, Foothill Boulevard, do you see that? Right above the 101? Yes. Okay. If a, if a caller is standing right there, do you know, is it, untenable that someone would hit one tower versus another or no it's certainly possible that the phone can select one tower and then select the next tower um, and in the next call or depending on where they're standing at the very moment or sitting or you know it's it's not uh, it's whatever that phone sees at the time their distance between those two towers and where that hypothetical caller is really is not too far outside of a service range for either tower to pick up that call. No, I would expect service from both of those towers in that indication, in that spot that you indicate in your Massey Drive. Okay. And then, um, I believe, are we on the next exhibit, 528, is that correct? 527. Sorry, 527. What does that give us? Uh, at 3.32 p.m., the um, cell phone connects to a cell tower um, in the Norco area, um, which is, I guess, approximately 10 miles south or so. I don't know exactly how far it is. The, when you, I'm going to go back to the previous exhibit, I believe that's 526, right? Yes. Okay. You logged a call at 101 and 303 from that tower on Church and Fennel, roughly? Yes, that's correct. And then the next hit 
on 527 is at 332. Is that correct? Yes, sir. When you do that, and there's that gap of time of approximately 30 minutes or so, what, were you noting any activity between, was there any activity in the records between those two that you noted? No, I, um, I mapped every cell tower that was available now. There were calls that didn't generate a cell tower. Um, I'd have to look at the records on that. Okay, so you did not omit any phone calls for the purposes of trying to map this out, did you? No, I mapped every available cell tower hit. And I'm going to go back to the AT&T, but I can find kind of the overhead briefly, just for an exemplar. So, I'm showing you line 9,000, 9,001, and 9,002 right here that show these brackets. Is that what you mean by an absence of cell tower location data? Yeah, for the AT&T phone, that's correct. There's no cell tower data for those those calls. Okay. And so you would not, if you mapped these calls, would not have plotted those. Is that correct? Yeah, there's no way to locate that the cell phone. There's no way to locate. There, there was no tower that carried anything that those were calls that were routed in voice voice mailbox. In this scenario. Can we go back to the computer, please, Jeffy? Thank you. Um, so your mapping is simply those only that generated cell tower data to be able to put on a map? Yes. So if in any records, whether T-Mobile or AT&T, there was any type of activity between, let's say, that 3 o'clock and 3.32 call, it may be there on the, on the call detail record, but you would not have mapped it? Yes. Yeah, so I don't, I, I don't have the records in front of you right now for the T-Mobile records, but for example, many carriers back in 2010 would not provide a cell tower if it was a text message. Um, and so if there was text message activity that doesn't have a cell tower associated with it, there's nothing to put on a map. So it could exist that there was a record, but there's nothing we can do to locate how that thing interacted with the, uh, the network. Okay. So correct me, we're on five. 27 going to 28? Yes, sir. Okay. So 528, what do you have for us? Um, these are a series of calls between 418 and 828 p.m. on the 4th, and those all connect to the cell tower uh, that's adjacent to um, 76 and Interstate 15, which is the same area that I indicated on the first slide, which was item 521. Just for consistency's sake, can you draw a circle and an R on that one too, so we have a point of reference? And that's the, again, the approximate area of the victim's residence in relation to that cell tower being logged from 418 to 828. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Do the same process for the defendant's phone records at 909-374-0102. Yes, sir. I'm going to bring you a very big stack from 443 to 520. You can quickly thumb through those and tell us if those are the diagrams and maps that you created from the defendant's records. Yeah, it appears that this is Can you give me those exhibit numbers again? Are they in order? Yes. So the first one I have is four forty three. The last one I have is five twenty.
did you, as part of this uh, mapping process, become familiar with what was believed to be the defendant's residence uh, at or near the time of these records? Yes. Okay. And can you find that on Exhibit 443? Yes. Okay. Because you're using another red pen, or the same red pen, if you can locate that on there with a circle and put a, I'm going to say DR for defendant's residence to distinguish it from the victim's residence. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jackson, can I have the overhead, please? Back to 443. If you can describe for us your mapping process with the defendant's record. Defendant's records, uh, as you saw earlier, they do include the uh, cell site locations. Um, our process, because of the uh, the fact that the phone chooses that first tower and it's not controlled by the network at that point, we only map the first cell tower because that's the best indicator as to which which tower the phone shows. Um, so all the all the cell tower connections that you're going to see were the first tower only. Um, so, with this item here, which is item 443, um, this is February 1st of 2010, and these are all the, the cell towers used between 8.25 a.m. and 10.14 p.m., so essentially most of the day, um, with the last call being at 10.14 p.m., there was a series of calls that connected to both of the two towers that are uh, indicated with the black arrows, uh, which is sort of uh, left of the defendant's residence and then slightly to the top right of the defendant's residence. These dots I see are in blue. Why is that? These are AT&T cell towers um, as they existed in 2010. Did T-Mobile and AT&T not share cell towers? No, each of the carriers has their own sets of cell towers. Does sharing actually, do you know if sharing occurs in some areas for any given reason? Yes, there are roaming agreements in some areas, uh, but in this, these particular areas, uh, AT&T had their own sets of towers. So if we were to go back to 420, uh, or 526, 527, showing McStay's pinging in this area, it was showing different tower locations, is that correct? Yes, some, some of the cell towers are either co-located with each other on the same pole, but it's their own antennas with their own networks. And then 444, oh, I'm sorry, back, it stopped here for a minute, 443. This indicates from 825 to 1014. Do you recall if there was multiple activities registered on the phone records during that time? Uh, they, there was because they hit basically the same towers. You didn't plot them all out individually. That's correct. I I do have the phone records if you want. I can look at them. I think a general response at this point. So there was multiple call data entries. Yes. Between those two towers from that time frame. Is that what this represents? Yes. Okay. Had there been activity that did not hit these two towers, would you have plotted it on another map or wherever it it hit? Yes. So 444, you have that in front of you? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us what that is? Uh, this is the, the next day, uh, because the previous map uh, concluded at the end of uh, February 1st, so this is February 2nd. 
um, would be first uh, the first call appearing at 8.43 a.m. and it's in the Temesco Canyon area which is south of Corona. And there's a series, uh, there's three minutes of activity at the uh, cell tower indicated on the top left, um, followed by an 8.50 a.m. hit on a air connection of the cell tower near Lake Elsinore, and then an 8.53 a.m. connection for the cell tower um, just below Lake Elsinore. Would these be, and I guess I could have asked this on the McStay records as well, we showed the tower hits going in a generally northbound direction on the 15. Are these handoffs or are these independent requests for resources on the CDRs, the call data reports? Yeah, I, didn't, I don't map the handoffs. I only map the first cell tower. So each of these are individual um, requests for resources, that first cell towers. Uh, 440. Five, I believe, is next. Is that correct? Yes. Can you tell us what that shows us? Uh, it's the continuation for February 2nd. Uh, this is a single call at 9.03 a.m. and connects with a cell tower in the Temecula area. And 4.46, I believe, is next. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> And this is uh, a continuation, February 2nd at 9.22 a.m. through 10.01 a.m. There's connections at, on a cell tower near Interstate 15 and Highway 76 uh, near the Avocado Vista Lane residence. You probably knew why I was walking up here with a red pin in my hand, didn't you? Yes. So in here, I'm going to have you draw another red circle, the approximate location but can you put VR for victim's residence to distinguish it from DR, the defendant's residence? Yes. Can you just point out on the diagram just so, or what's being projected so we know the general location you're referring to? Okay, I'm pointing to the area just to the right of the blue dot indicated uh, as the tower that was connected with. And again, you labeled that VR, is that correct? Yes. And 447, is that next? Yes. And this is continuation February 2nd, um, 1017 AM. Um, the cell phone connects with the tower slightly north of the victim residence in the, what's known as the Rainbow area. Um, and then continuing 1020 and 1022 as it, the, the cell phone connects the towers um, entering into the Temecula area. 448, is that next? Yes. Uh, continuation of February 2nd, 1031 a.m., um, followed by 1035, and continuing in a northbound fashion. Um, 1043 to 1044 a.m. in the Horsey Canyon area, followed by a cell tower connection at 1047 a.m. in South Corona. 449, is that next? Yes. So, what you documented there? Yes, again, a continuation of February 2nd, 10.56 a.m., uh, the cell phone connects to a tower at Lime Night and Interstate 15, followed by 11.01, 11.02, and 11.05 a.m., uh, consistent with northbound travel uh, along Interstate 15. And again, when you say consistent with, you cannot say with any certainty that that phone was traveling on the 15 as opposed to on Hammer Avenue or Etiwanda Avenue. That's correct. And for reference, those are the streets that are just due east and west of the 15, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, 449, is that where we're at? 450. Sorry, 450. Um, again, this is a uh, continuation on February 2nd from 11.10 a.m. through 12.04 p.m., so right around the lunchtime, uh, and there's connections at the two cell towers near the defendant's residence. Did 
I leave my red pen up there for you? Can you, uh, on that exhibit, write DR in a circle as well so we can keep consistency in locating landmarks? Thank you. No problem. And for, are we on 451? Yes. This is, uh, again, February 2nd. Uh, continuation from the previous map. Um, this is 1234 to 1247, the cell phone shows a tower in the Covina area, um, which is slightly to the west of uh, where the ranch troop among the previous tower connections were. And then at 1257 p.m., there's a connection heading back towards the east um, near Interstate 10 and I believe Mount San Antonio Avenue. One or two? What's our next one? 452. 452. Again, this is February 2nd. And this is a, uh, a series of cell tower connections in the Ranch Group among the area starting at 1.12 p.m. Um, Baseline Avenue just slightly to the east of Interstate 15. And then... ...through 1.45 p.m. Uh, in the same general area. And that same general area is near where the you know understood the defendant's residence to be? Yes, the calls at 114, 115, and 145 are consistent with those two towers that are near his residence. Can you uh, put that magic circle with a DR on it as well, please? Yes. So on 453, are we still on February 2nd? Yes, we are. And this is uh, two calls at 2.26 p.m. and 2.38 p.m. Uh, the 2.26 call is on Azusa Avenue, uh, just north of West Covina. And then the 2.38 call is near the Interstate 57, just south of the Interstate 210. Become familiar with a location uh, called Metro Sheet Metal. Yes. Can on this uh, map, can you locate it amongst all of the squiggly small lines? At least its general location. I believe it's just south of Gladstone. I believe it's to the west of Azusa Avenue, just south of Gladstone, near where my red marker is on the left side of the map. Um, I don't know the exact uh, exact location, but I believe it's somewhere in this area right here. Okay. Can you use that magic red marker and put on exhibit 450 around 3? 453. 453, a circle with MSM. Is that where we're at? 
456. 456. Again, I'm always one behind. February 2nd, still, correct? Yes, uh, and this, this map shows a series of calls between 421 p.m. and 510 p.m. Uh, connecting with uh, two different cell towers in the area just south of where we're at now. Um, so this would be sort of south San Bernardino, maybe the Loma Linda area. So are we up to 460? Is that what it is? Okay, we're we still on February 2nd. Yes. Okay, what do we have now? All right, 5.53 and 6 p.m. are calls uh, in the Fontana area, um, consistent with travel in the westbound direction. Okay. Are we moving to 4.58? Yes. Okay. Are we still on February 2nd? Yes. These calls range from 6.18 p.m. through 10.58 p.m. and there are three different cell towers used in the Ranch Cucamonga area. And on 458, can you uh, pinpoint for us the defendant's residence again with that red marker? Yes. Yes. 
these, uh, there's a series of calls on, that connect with five different cell towers starting at 2.35 p.m. and continuing through 5.56 p.m. Uh, consistent with travel from west to east towards the Ranch Group area. 4.66 or 6.66? Four sixty-six. Are we still on the third? Are we still on the third? Uh, February fourth. All right. So February fourth. What did you plot for? Uh, the first call of the day is at nine forty-four a.m. and the uh, connects with a cell tower near Interstate sixty and fifteen. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm reading this backwards. Uh, we start at the bottom. The first call of the day is nine thirty-six a.m. Uh, and continuing. And to hit two, three different cell towers through 9.44 a.m., consistent with travel from Norco in the northern direction. 469? 70? 467. 467. February 4th. Um, these are the cell towers connected between 9.51 a.m. and 5.48 p.m., so the majority of the day. Can you please locate on there uh, the defendant's residence, the defendant's general location, with a circle and a D and an R, please? Yes. Can you accomplish that? Yes. Uh, are we on 468 now? Yes. Okay. Are we still on the floor? Yes. <clears throat> uh, the next available call after the last cell tower connection on at 5.48 p.m. is at 9.32 p.m. and it connects with a cell tower um, in the, I call it the Mariloma areas, um, near Interstate 15, north of Norco, but south of Ontario. And you made that notation in writing on the bottom of the exhibit, is that correct? Yes, is I like that, that. Is that accurate? Yes. When I show you 439C, can I have the overhead, please? Do you see that 548 um, request for service in the CDR? Yes. Do you see the next? Well, so now I'm going to zoom out so if we can follow the line across. And it has cell tower data, correct? It does. The next line that has cell tower data is when? 9.32 p.m. That would be here? Yes. So here are the cell tower data, correct? Yes. What are these brackets in between? What is that activity? Those were incoming calls that got uh, sent to voicemail, and um, with the lack of the equipment identifier in there, it indicates the phone could be off, off the network, airplane mode, any, any one of those. Well, is there a difference between I'm in an area nowhere near a cell tower signal strong enough versus airplane mode or off? No, the network, in, in any one of those situations, the network can't see the phone, so the, it can't decipher it. And at, least the, at least with these records, you can't tell. Your Honor, I believe you had indicated to counsel you wanted to stop about now for today. Is that Actually, uh, we can go a little bit longer now. Oh. If you, we can go until about 4.15. Okay, it's up to you. Your charge. <laughs> Can we go back to computer? Uh oh, hold on.
further activity after the 932 call on February 4th? There was not. That was the last call on February 4th. So moving to February 5th, and that should be Exhibit 469? That's correct. <clears throat> uh, February 5th starts off with a 7 a.m. Uh, cell tower connection in the Upland area, uh, just south of Interstate 210. I want to go back to uh, 468, if I may. Like, where was this tower data located? Uh, it's in the Marin Loma area, uh, which is the 9.32 p.m. on February 4th, um, which is south of Interstate 60, and that cell tower is um, east of Interstate 50. Sorry, so back to 4.69 on February 5th, what did we have? Uh, the first call of the day is at 7 a.m. in the Upland area, uh, just south of Interstate 210. And 470, is that on February 5th as well? Yes, on four, uh, February 5th, the next two calls available are at 10.45 and 10.46 a.m., and they are in the Santa Clarita area, um, just off of Highway 14. 471, correct? Is that <laughs> yes. Is that still on February 5th? Yes. Uh, this is a 10.59 a.m. single uh, Connection and that is in the San Fernando area. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, it's uh, Interstate 210. We're on 471, correct? 472. 472, February 5th? Yes. Um, at 1249 p.m. through 223 p.m., the towers connected are the two towers uh, adjacent to the defendant residence. Can you please? Circle again for defendant's residence with your red pen. Okay. That caused me to lose track. 473? Okay. Oh, oh. Not that it's hard for me to lose track. So 473, are we still on the fifth? Yes, sir. And these are uh, cell towers connected to uh, between uh, 2.32 p.m. and 3.54 p.m. Um, these four towers are connected in the Ranch Street Market area. And next would be 4.74? Yes. Are we still on the 5th? We are. And <clears throat> these are um, three calls, 9.17 and 9.18, connecting to the same tower in the... Uh, Maryland area near Lime Night at 15, followed by 925 um, p.m. connection slightly north of that uh, adjacent to Interstate 15. So you have a notation here in the left. What is that? I was just indicating that the from the previous map, which was 473. Let me go up to that. The last cell tower connection on that map was 354, and the next available activity was at 9.17 p.m., so there was no activity on the phone uh, during that period of time. And the cell tower at 9.17 is at Limonite, correct? Yes. Limonite at 15, but at 3.54, were they hitting towers north, south, east, or west of that Limonite tower? At 3.54, the cell tower is in the Ranch Cucamonga area, which is north of the Lime Night and intersection with the 15. So would it be fair to say that something happened between 3.54 p.m. and 9.17 p.m. to cause the defendant's phone to be somewhere to the south of Rancho Cucamonga? It's actually constant speculation. Sustained. Okay, uh, what are we on to? 474? 475. 475. And now, February 6th. Correct. Uh, February 6th, the first call of the day is at 1046 a.m. Uh, up in the high desert uh, near the intersection of uh, Mojave Drive and Interstate 15. Followed by uh, some calls between 1130 a.m. and 1152 a.m. in Oro Grande. Um, and then some call, a call at 1153 a.m., 
back down near the Victorville area. Call it 1.30, I'm sorry, 1249 p.m. in the Hesperia area, and then another call connecting to the cell tower in the uh, Oro Grande area at 1.30 p.m. Okay. Well, <coughs> to be precise, that area you're describing as Oro Grande is quite a large area on that map, is it not? Yes, it's that particular cell tower is on top of a fairly large map. Okay. So Oro Grande on the exhibit for 75 is to the left of the cell tower that you're indicating was hit at 1130, 1152, and 130. Yes, that's correct. And I'm going to do this through the overhead if I can't, may, Mr. Jackson, Deputy Jackson. When you looked at the records, the call detail records, I'm showing you Exhibit 529. Okay. You recognize that? Yes, this is a, um, like a, a snippet I took out of the records um, to place them with the maps to show the call detail records. Okay. And what purpose was it for you to create this exhibit? I, I knew that these particular calls were going to be of importance um, due to the, the fact that we're in the high desert uh, with the, the uh, latitude and longitude of the crime scene I was provided. So I decided to cut these from the records and put them in with the maps so they would be more easily referenced. Note in there the call time on the left, correct? Yes. And then the cell tower location in azimuth on the right, is that correct? That's correct. And an azimuth is the direction the array or receiver is pointing, correct? Yes, that's the... The bad artwork I gave you? Yeah, those are your words. <laughs> and I'll, I'll admit my faults. So, uh, exhibit 531, to help explain at least the location of the cell tower, did you pull this data? Yes, that was from uh, a Google Earth software. Okay. And what was the purpose of developing Exhibit 531? I wanted to see the relation from of the cell tower to the crime scene as far as a line of sight to determine if there was going to be any obstructions or um, you know if there were any large hills in the way or anything of that nature. Why is that important? It could, it could have a bearing on whether I would expect to see cell tower coverage uh, in that geographic area from that particular cell tower. And the top half shows us what? Oh, the top half is uh, the map that's generated by uh, Google Earth. And as you draw a line from the latitude and longitude of the tower to the latitude and longitude provided to me for the crime scene. Uh, the bottom half is generated by the software to show you the geographic profile of what, uh, what it looks like from an uh, elevation perspective. Can you point out to the jurors the location of the tower for us on this exhibit 531? It's, um, I'm pointing the laser dot at it and it's labeled AT&T Tower and it's uh, on top of this hill or mountain, if you will. Okay. And the crime scene you entered, its location? Yes, the crime scene is indicated by the word crime scene. And the longitude and latitude you got from that, where did you get that information to be able to be accurate? The, the crime scene location? It was provided to me by Detective Hankey. The terrain slope that's generated at the bottom by Google Maps goes from what elevation? Uh, 4,522. I'm not sure what the location is or the elevation on the bottom, but the, uh, the screen indicates it's 
somewhere north of 3,000 feet. Let me show, if you can oh. see it on there better. Approximately 3,021 feet is the, is the crime scene elevation there. So it's a difference of approximately 1,500 feet. And the distance, it'll give you a distance from the tower to the crime scene marker. Seven miles. Sorry, I had to find it on there. As the crow flies in a straight line, not on a curvy road, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So to help explain the azimuth readings that you noted in the CDRs, I'm showing you exhibit number 530. Did you create that as well? I did. And can you please explain for the jury what that is? Uh, this is a uh, map I created. It's uh, similar to the previous map for the calls at uh, between 11.30 and 11.52, um, but it includes that extra detail of that direction or the actual antenna. Um, it shows sort of how those antennas are oriented. Can you please now walk the jury through exhibit 530. Sorry, 530. Okay. Um, so, do you mind if I stand up here? Yeah, that's fine. All right, so using, using that column to the right uh, on the CDRs, which indicates the, uh, the cell tower location as well as the azimuth, the calls uh, that exist at 1130, uh, 1131, 33, and 34, and 1152, um, the color does not look as good, but it, those are at azimuth of 80 to 85 degrees. Uh, and remember that 90 degrees is going to be uh, due east, so it's going to be slightly, just slightly pitched a little bit uh, to the north of due east. And that's indicated by, um, there's it's actually a, a two black arms that are, extending out the cell tower that create a 120 degree angle pointing essentially due east. Um, at 11.32 a.m., the phone selected the tower facing at 10 degrees, which is to the north, um, and that's the, that's the tower that the phone selected for that particular call. What is the I see three black lines in your chart, if I may. And I may have missed this explanation. This line here, what does it represent? Okay. All right, well, first of all, I, I think is a, these, this called 1132, it was originally in blue ink. So these two arms here were originally in blue ink, but they're appearing to be black here. But I'm slightly colored blind, so. Um, so the 10 degree azimuth is indicated by this, this boundary here and this boundary here, the one that kind of bisects the, uh, there's an overlap between the two antennas essentially. Um, the little semicircles that you see uh, coming off the towers, those aren't an indicator of range, they're not an indicator of anything other than the direction that it's pointing. Um, so you're not confused in, that you think that it's pointing in sort of a southern, uh, southwest direction. So those towers, or those, sorry, those receivers, the 10 degree one is pointing almost due north, maybe a little off of due north? Yes. To the east, right? Yes. And then the other uh, receiver is pointing just a little north of due east uh, towards the 15 freeway and Apple Valley, right? Yes. They do not point south, right? Not during these calls. No, the, the receivers don't, right? There is an antenna pointing south, but it was not chosen for these particular calls. Okay. Was there an antenna pointing east? Or, sorry, west? Yes. And it didn't re re uh, select that those receivers, or that receiver? Not for these calls at these times. 
Lastly, the location of this tower that you're referring to in this nice diagram. Did you happen to take a photo of it? I did. Showing you 905 for identification. Do you recognize that? Yes. Is that a photo you took of the tower? I did. series of towers that you see in this um, uh, photograph. There's multiple antennas up there from multiple uh, carriers. So I did take a picture of the area where all these antennas are. I do not know the specific antenna um, that carried this call. And, and one of the reasons is that I took this photo in 2016. Okay. And I don't even know if the same antenna is up there from 2010. So I just wanted to make that clear. But when you took this picture, where were you standing? I was standing adjacent to the crime scene. This tall red and white tower, is that typically a cell phone tower? No. What is that typically? I don't know what it is. It may be an AM radio, could be emergency, uh, like police or fire, uh, but it's not a typical cell tower. Okay. And there's a, looks to be three smaller ones to the right or shorter ones to the right. Are those cell tower capable type towers? Those look much more like cell towers. And when I was there in person, they, they were definitely cell towers. And how can you tell? Just from my training and experience, and I know what cell towers look like. Your Honor, is this a good time for you to stop? Sure. <coughs> sure. <coughs> sure. <We'll>, uh, <laughs> Go ahead and take our uh, evening recess at this time till uh, 9.30 Monday morning. Keep in mind uh, the admonitions previously given to you, not to form or express any opinions about the case, not to discuss the case. And again, that means not to discuss anything about the case. Any of the witnesses, testimony, exhibits, parties, or attorneys. And we'll see everyone back Monday morning at 9.30.